Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Free Gaming Today Com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with AMD's 2500X. Now, a user on the Chip Hell forum has managed to procure one of these chips a little early, and there is a couple of interesting things that he has noted down. The first is that it seems to be a single CCX design. Now this can be found out through looking at the CPU-Z image, and you can see that it is listed as a one single eight megabyte uh, level three cache rather than two times four megabytes. Now there are a couple of things we need to take into consideration. One, CPU-Z could be certainly screwing up here, or it's possible just the way that the chip is being read generally even by the motherboard's BIOS could also be the problem. But if we do take that this news is true, this could actually be a nice improvement for chips which have four cores for AMD. This means that with previous Zen designs, for example, the 1500X for sake of argument, you would have two cores per CCX module active. So you would have two CCXs, and each of those CCXs would have two cores enabled, along with four megabytes of level three cache. So what would essentially happen is that if a core that was on CCX1 wanted data that was in, say, the uh, level three cache of CCX2, uh, or perhaps if core needs to transfer data from core one to core two, uh, free, then you could have some latency there. Whereas now cores at zero to three, one, two, three, four, they just, it starts from core zero, just to clarify, you would actually find that the latency would at least in theory be a little better. I'm going to read out a translation. This is a credit to a user on Reddit. His name is AI2ME6. All scores are auto already very close to a 6700K on multi-core performance, although single core is still weaker for AMD, it's a significant improvement over the 1500X. It's a one CCX core, unlike the 1500X, which had two CCXs and 16 megabytes of level three cache, but the 16 megabytes of level three cache can't beat the 2500X with eight megabytes of level three. Uh, the IMC is stronger than a uh, previous generation, that's the memory controller. The improvement for 14, to 12 nm is about 10 percent overall lower latencies and higher ram frequencies this is something that we did know actually in our own review of uh, the 2700x along with a lot of our coverage one of the definite improvements of the zen plus architecture was of course the tweaks yes to the cache uh, and reduced latencies across the chip but also the improved memory control is certainly a bonus and we didn't have any issues getting our ram running at 3000 or above megahertz which is certainly a lot different to what we had uh, experienced with like let's say the 1700x or the 1600x of of course the original ryzen generation I would like to stress, however, this is not confirmation that we are looking at a single CCX module design. Um, it is also possible that there are two CCXs on there, but one of them has been lasered off and they've just simply just made it a single CCX. Or it's possible that AMD have really good yields and there is only a single CCX on this chip. Until we start seeing them appear in the wild, in other words, retail samples, and of course people start to delete them and do the normal stuff, it's going to be very difficult to know for certain. But if it is true, it's going to be excellent news for folks who are on a budget because it just essentially means that the 2500X is going to be a really nice gaming processor. The 6700K uh, still holds up very well today. So um, it's going to be a really nice budget chip in my opinion. It is, of course, four cores and eight threads. And just quickly to go through the uh, leak specif um, sorry, the leaked uh, benchmarks here, we're looking at a core speed of 4,000 megahertz. That, of course, is with uh, turbo frequencies, uh, 80 megabytes level three cache. Each core has 512 kilobytes of level two cache, of course. Single uh, processor performance is 441 for the single thread. Uh, that's in comparison to a 6700K, which is getting uh, 474. Four. So yes, you're looking at around a 40, sorry, a 30 point difference there, but 
Crucially, the multi-thread performance is a little higher, looking at 2,459 compared to 2,377. So you're looking at around 100 points difference in multi-core performance. And let's face it, if you're doing gaming, which I suspect a lot of people are going to want to purchase one of these processors for, for a budget-orientated gaming system, then without a question, this is a really nice CPU. Now we're going to move over to NVIDIA and the Xavier Jetson SOC. So yes, this has automotive uh, uses, but it is a very cool piece of technology. And for a start, it does fully support PCIe 4. PCIe 4 doubles the transfer rates available over PCIe 3. So obviously this is a lot more future-proof. And as an aside, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing NVIDIA GPUs uh, quite quickly start to pick this up on the GPU side for, let's say, gaming as well. I'm not quite certain we're going to get it with the 11 series, but I certainly think, uh, feel by the time that we get to the 12 series, yes, we will definitely be on PCIe 4. Although, don't forget, PCIe 4 is going to be a fairly short-lived specification. We're going to quickly move over to PCIe 5, which follows just a year or two later. NVIDIA did actually reveal a lot of the uh, Jetson Xavier, also known as the Isaac platform at Computex 2018, but in the NVIDIA developer YouTube channel we now have a lot more information regarding this specific platform. I'm going to go over a couple of the key specifications here just because I find them rather interesting. So the Jetson Xavier SOC has technical specifications which means it's configurable for 10, 15 and 30 watts which means obviously it has a wide gamut of different usage scenarios. As I said, a lot of these can be automotive, but it certainly could be used for other things as well. In terms of performance then, it is built on the TSMC 12NM process node, much like Volta. In fact, we are looking at a Volta-based GPU here. We have a total of 512 CUDA cores and it does actually also contain tensor cores as well. We'll get more into that performance in just a moment. This is also with an NVIDIA custom-built uh, Car Carmel AMR64 CPU. So that's eight uh, CPU cores in a 10-wide superscalar architecture. Uh, it does have functional safety. Functional safety is typically for things which have high resilience requirements, automotive trains, Things where if something falls over, it's not going to just be like, you know, application.exe has crashed and that's about it. No, it's going to be like application.exe has crashed and then you crash and you probably got horrific accident. So instead, when it's referring to that type of resiliency, it basically means that the chip A has been built to high standards, but B, it also has resiliency built in. So if a component fails, if something goes wrong, then you're not just going to be totally and utterly, a technical term, screwed. We also have dual execution, parity, and error correction available on the CPU itself. Uh, ECC, of course, would also be very important because, well, if you start getting errors once again in calculations and you're in a vehicle which is autonomous, not exactly the best uh, situation to be in. Uh, the chip delivers 1.3 T-flops of FP32 performance and 20 tensor core tops as well. And this is using just 20 watts. You can actually increase this to 30 tops if you're within a 30 watt TDP. So obviously there is a lot of extra horsepower there if they're running at higher clock speeds. This is with 137 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Uh, system memory is 16 gigabytes of 256 bit uh, low power DDR4. And once again, it is just using 80, uh, sorry, 30 watts. Compare this to the Pascal based uh, Drive PX2 which had 256 Pascal cores, uh, Volta once again has 512 of it, and you can start seeing the massive levels of performance difference. Uh, NVIDIA are going to start to release this over the next several months, and it's very cool. Now, I know some people don't particularly like the whole autonomous driving things, especially when you start seeing it in conferences like Computex, and people are like, where are the new GPU cards? But ultimately, I actually have some interest in it. I, I do find this kind of technology rather interesting, especially because Volta 12NM is now obviously a lot more mature in terms of manufacturing processes. Obviously, they're getting a lot better yields. And the thing that really impresses me is just how scalable this is. Now, whether we're going to get any 
relation between this and the so-called Turing architecture? Who knows? But I, am, I would not be ultra surprised if we did CPT IE4 for Turing or slash GTX 11, but I don't think we're quite there yet. I don't think it's going to be until the next generation of GPUs. But even so, it is pretty darn cool just how scalable these chips actually are now in terms of power consumption. So mining and graphics card prices have of course gone hand in hand for some time. Since around the midpoint of 2016, GPU prices started to go up and up and up, and certainly around the midpoint of 2017, yeah, it was just not good. We would often see GTX 1080s go like seven, eight hundred, nine hundred, even a thousand US dollars at some point, especially when you started to look at the more custom premium cards. And the 1080s weren't even the best for mining. The 1060s also had massive price ramp ups. The 1080 Ti's, and of course, well, goodness gracious, look at Vegas. Not only did you have to do deal with the fact that uh, the Vega cards had, well, HBM2, so those costs were also quite extortionate uh, in terms of the actual HBM2 costs for AMD, and obviously they were dealing with shortages. But on top of that, Vega happened to be really good for mining, and AMD's entire lineup of cards, the RX 580, the 570s, which should have been good mainstream cards, cards which were aimed at budget oriented uh, gamers, you know, people who wanted to play at like 1080p or possibly 1440p at a reasonable budget, those cards just doubled in price and perhaps even more. Well, there is some good news, and that is prices are definitely coming down. There's a couple of reasons for this. One, mining certainly is starting to tail off now uh, with the arrival of dedicated mining assets and the fact that mining isn't quite as profitable as it used to be. And of course, we are all waiting impatiently for the next generation of GPUs as well. But how are prices going? Well, PCWorld.com actually did a bit of an investigation and uh, Amy and I also did a bit of uh, our own investigation as well. So you can start seeing Amazon selling 4 gigabyte uh, RX 580s for $210, that's including rebates. Um, cards such as the GTX 1080, you can get for around the 500 mark to even the mid 400 mark, which is obviously a considerable improvement indeed. The 1060 is around the 300 mark or even lower. Of course, there are some inevitable questions there. Should you actually buy now with the 11 series coming at, uh, well, at some point or another, we know it's coming, but as for the date, well, all we know is it's most likely going to be within the next quarter, let's say within the next two to three months, but we can't have a specific release window there. And combine this with certain vendors doing incredible deals right now. Uh, I think it's ASRock were doing an RX 580, and you got a free motherboard for like 300 bucks. Now, if you're building an AMD rig, and you pair that with, if you can be really lucky and buy like a 1700 uh, X or one of the pre, one of the original generation Ryzen processors, and you can actually get them at a really steep discount now because obviously they are EOL end of line. Therefore, a lot of vendors are getting rid of them at really cheap prices. Although like that's starting to tail off now, you can buy a really good system for like you know 400 450 US dollars, and you've got the makings of a the CPU, the GPU, the motherboard, and then all you need, of course, is possibly RAM, depending on what you've currently got, and you're in a pretty darn good spot. So I would understand why some people would possibly just want to jump on things now. Ultimately, I think if you're probably going to be spending around the 200 to 300 US dollar mark, and don't crucify me if I'm wrong here, but if you're probably spending around that much, there's not going to be a GPU which enters the mainstream segment. Typically, you will see, like for example, with the Pascal, the GTX 1080 and the 1070 launched first. Then, of course, Nvidia starts to fill the lineup with the TIs and the 1060s and the 1050s and goodness knows what else coming a little later. And AMD do much the same. Like the 570 and the 580 came first. And, well, you get the idea by now. Therefore, if you're on a budget at least of around the 200 to 300 US dollar mark, the prices coming down are probably a really good thing. But if you are going to be paying a lot more cash, if you have, for example, 500 or 600 US dollars or whatever in pounds or your regional currency available to you, then it might just be better to buy now. I mean, obviously, if you're in no rush and you can wait, then certainly do wait for the mid-range next generation cards if that's kind of your budget. But if you do need a card now 
and your budget is only around, let's say, 250 US dollars, if I were you, personally, I would just say, screw it, I'm going to jump on the 1060, or I'm going to jump on the RX 580, or whatever you can buy, because you never know what's going to happen. We have still seen, uh, I covered this just the other day, that RAM prices are going up at the moment, and yes, GDDR6 is slightly more expensive than GDDR5. It's still a little unknown uh, in terms of the pricing of RAM. It's It has stabilized a little bit, but that's not saying much. That's like me saying, well, okay, you're no longer going to burn with falling into lava. Instead, I'm just going to use this flamethrower. It's like not much better. But anyway, with all of that said, um, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.